This is Formal Methods Lecture 9 Recap. And the first topic is a proof technique meta theorem, which in our textbook is 3.6. Now, do you remember what a meta theorem is? It is a theorem about theorems. So, this proof technique meta theorem is 3.6 in, in our textbook, and it says. To prove that P equals Q is a theorem, transform P to Q or Q to P using Leibniz. So you see this is a theorem about theorems. It is a theorem about how to prove a theorem. So this is a proof technique meta theorem. Now we are going to illustrate this proof technique meta theorem by proving 3.15, which is not P equals P equals false. And we are going to prove it two ways. First, we will prove it the way we normally have done up until now, by starting with the theorem and getting it to a previously proved axiom or theorem. And then we will prove it using the proof technique meta theorem, which is a, a slightly different way to, to, to prove it. All right, so here we go with the first proof of 3.15. We start off by writing down the word proof, and if you are doing this by hand, you would underline that word proof. And then the first line of the proof is the entire theorem that we are trying to prove, not P equals P equals false. Now the first step of this proof is to outdent, put equals, indent, put the hint angle bracket, and we are going to use 3.9 with Q replaced by P. Now let's go back and check 3.9 and see what it looks like when we replace Q with P. So here is 3.9, axiom distributivity of negation over equivalence. And we see that this is not open paren P equals Q equals not P equals Q. And if everywhere there is a Q, we replace it with P, what do we get? We get not open paren P equals P, close paren, equals not P equals P, without the parens. And so you see, that's what we have written down in our hint. We wrote that down in our hint, not open paren P equals P, close paren equals not P equals P. And now what we do is we identify this not P equals P in our hint with the not P equals P in the first line of our proof. And because these are equal, what do we do? We use Leibniz. And we, replay, and we substitute equals for equals. So that red not P equals P in the first line of our proof, we substitute not open print P equals P close print in the in the second line of the proof. So there's the first step using substitution followed by Leibniz. Now, the next step of the proof is to outdent, put equals, indent, put the angle bracket for the hint. And this time we are going to use 3.3 identity of equivalents with Q replaced by P. So let's go back at and look at 3.3, and everywhere there is a Q, let's replace it with P and see what it looks like. So here we are. It is axiom identity of e equivalence, and it is true equals Q equals Q. But if everywhere there is a Q, we replace it with P, what do we get? We get true equals P equals P. So let's go back to our proof. And sure enough, we have written down true equals P equals P. And now what do we do? We identify the P equals P in the hint of our proof, in this proof step. And we, we see that that's the same thing as P equals P in the parentheses of the previous line of the proof. So what do we do? We use Leibniz. Because we know that P equals P is the same thing as true, we bring down the negation. We, for P equals P, we make that true, and then we bring down the equals false. And now, what do we do? We, we notice that this is the same thing as 3.8. So we are claiming that not true equals false is, is the same thing as 3.8. Well, let's go back and check that. And sure enough, here is 3.8. Oh, wait a minute, this looks a little different from what we had. 
we had not true equal else false, and here we have false equal else not true. But that's tri those are trivially the same thing because of this axiom 3.2 symmetry of equivales. So 3.2 says that P equivales Q is the same thing as Q equivales P. So we can do that symmetry step in our head. We don't need to write that down. So indeed we can identify this as not true equal equivales false as being the same as 3.8 and that's the end of our proof. Now this is the the way that we have proved theorems up until now. But now with this proof technique meta theorem, we can do it a slightly different way. Instead of starting with the whole thing, we are going to start with just one side. So now our proof using the proof technique meta theorem is to not start with the entire theorem, but to start with the not p equals p. And now we and now our goal is not to get it to a previously proved theorem, but to get it to false, which is the right-hand side of 3.15, the right-hand side of the equivalence in 3.15. So the proof proceeds very similarly to the way we did it before, namely, the first step of the proof, we use 3.9 with Q replaced by P, and again, this is not open paren P equals P, close paren equals not P equals P. And we identify the not p equals p with the not p equals p that we have, and because that's equivalent to not open paren p equals p, we have not open paren p equals p, similarly to the way we did it before. And then the next step is 3.3 identity of equals with q replaced by p, which again is true equals p equals p. We identify the p equals p as we did before. And because that's the same thing as true, we just bring down the not, and, we, and that becomes not true. But now, is this a previously proved theorem? No, we have one more step that we must do. But now what we do is we use 3.8 in the hint of our proof. So using 3.8, we see that not true is the same equal else false. So we end with false, and once we, end, once we have false, we are done. Now notice here that when we use this proof technique meta theorem, we cannot quote the last line as being a previously proved theorem because it is not. False is not a previously proved theorem. Whereas if you start with the entire theorem, you must identify the last line as a previously proved theorem. So in the first proof we have we end with which is 3.8 but in the second proof we end with just false and we and we can't identify a previously proved theorem because there is no there is none false is not a previously proved axiom or theorem now so in this example let's go back to our meta theorem our meta theorem has a capital p and a capital q in it it says to prove that capital P equals capital Q is a theorem. So in this example, what we did, oh, and it says to transform capital P to capital Q. Or so in this use of the meta theorem, our capital P is what we started with, not P equals P, and our capital Q is false. And we got capital P to be equivalent to capital Q. So we got not P equals P to be the same thing as false. Okay, so now here's the issue. Both of these proofs are mathematically correct. Okay, but my question to you is, which one's better? Which one looks better? And we have, so what we want to do is we want to be able to prove with style. So the question is, which one has better style? And the answer is, the first one has bad style. Why does the first one have bad style? Because we have to re we have this equals false on every single line of our proof. Equals false, equals false, equals false. That just looks ugly. So even though the second proof is one step longer, still we prefer it. And this is encapsulated in the following principle. 
proof, a proof style guideline. And it's paragraph 3.22 in our textbook. And the principle is to structure proofs to avoid repeating the same sub-expression on many lines. You see what the sub-expression that is repeated on many lines in this example is this equivalence false. That's why it's bad style. Why should you have to repeat equivalence false, equivalence false, equivalence false? You know, you, I mean, look, just, just visually, can't you see that the second proof is cleaner? There's not as much clutter in it, you see. So we prefer the second to the first. So whenever you're proving these things, even though it can be mathematically correct, and occasionally when we have a choice, we will choose the first one, but not very often. We generally prefer the second uh, proof style compared to the first. All right, now the next thing I'd like to do is for us to review exactly what and how these inference rules are used in, in this uh, calculation logic system that we are learning. This, so this material is from the first lecture. Do you remember that we have an analogy of a computational system with an axiomatic logic system? And in a computational system, a program takes input and processes it and produces output. And in the same vein, an axiomatic logic system has inference rules and given the axioms, the inference rules turns, turns the axioms into theorems. So given the inference rules and some axioms, the logic system produces theorems. And, the, and we said that there are four inference rules for logic proofs. There's substitution, Leibniz, equanimity, and transitivity. And so what I would like for us to do now is for us to see how we used these four inference rules in this proof that we just did. So, let's take a look at substitution. In the first step, in our proof of 3.15, we used 3.9 with Q replaced by P. So that is an example of using substitution. The capital E in the substitution inference rule is 3.9. And the lowercase z is our variable Q and the expression capital F is P. And so substitution allowed us to get 3.9 into a form where we could use it in the first step of our proof. Then here's how we used Leibniz. Again, in the first step of the proof. The Leibniz is if x equals y is true in all states, then any expression with any variable replaced by any expression is equal to that same expression with that variable replaced by any other expression. In this example, the expression x is not p equals p, and the expression y is not open paren p equals p close paren. And the first line of our proof was e was z replaced by x, and the second line of our proof was e was z replaced by y, with a hint in between those, those two lines of the proof. So I think you should be able to see that the expression e, capital E, is z equals false. And we did some exercises earlier on to try to emphasize to see how that worked. Now the net, so both a substitution and Leibniz are explicit. In other words, we can identify exactly, we, we, we use them explicitly in each step of the proof. Whereas the second two, equanimity and transitivity, are implicit. So here's how we use equanimity. Equanimity says that if x is true in all states, and if x equals y, then y is true in all states. So you see, in this example, x is the first line of our proof, and y is the second line of our proof, with a hint in between. And so what we are saying is that we know that if we assume that x is true in all states, and if the hint shows us that x equals y, then we are then that tells us that y is also true in all states. So that is the implicit use of equanimity. 
and our implicit use of transitivity is as follows. Transitivity says that if x equals y in all states, and if y equals z in all states, then our conclusion is that x equals z in all states. And so, and so in this example, our x is the first line of our proof, the y is the second line of our proof, and the z is the third line of our proof with the hints in between. And so what we showed is, because we showed that x equals y in the first step of the proof, and that y equals z in the second part of the proof, then that tells us that x equals z, and so on. So those are the implicit, that's the implicit use of transitivity in these proofs. Now, the second topic is a heuristic. A, the, in three point, paragraph 3.23 of our textbook, we have this heuristic of definition elimination. Now, what is a heuristic? A heuristic is a rule of thumb or a guideline to help you uh, get, get to, to give you directions on how to prove a theorem. So it's kind of like uh, a recipe or a guideline or a rule of thumb. And this particular heuristic says to prove a theorem concerning an operator circle that is defined in terms of another, say, solid circle, you expand the definition of the first one to arrive at a formula that contains the second one, you exploit the properties of the second one to, main, to manipulate the formula, and then you reintroduce the, re, reintroduce the first one using its definition. Now this seems like a lot of blah 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 stuff, but it's actually um, not that difficult to understand after we've done it a few times. So let's do an example of this heuristic of definition elimination. This, by the way, is right out of the textbook, a logical approach to, to discrete math, which I cannot praise highly enough. It is a, an amazing book. OK, to illustrate the use of this heuristic, we, we prove 3.16. So 3.16 is p not equals q equals q not equals p. So here, the first operator is not equivales, and the second operator is equivales. All right, so let's prove it. And we are going to use that proof technique meta theorem, by the way. We're going to start with the left-hand side and get it to e equal the right-hand side. So we're going to start with p not equals q. OK, so let's do the proof. The first step of the proof, we outdent, put equals, we indent, put definition of not equals 3.10. We better check that. Let's go back to 3.10 and see if that's right. Sure enough, here is 3.10, definition of not equivales. P not equivales Q is equivalent to not parentheses, P equivales Q, close parentheses. So that's our, there's our definition of not, not equivales. So P not equivales Q is the same thing as not open paren, P equivales Q is close paren. And so we have done the first step of the heuristic. We, we expanded the definition of not equivales to arrive at a formula that contains equivales. And now what we can do is we can use 3.2, which is symmetry of equivales. And symmetry of equivales says that we can swap the P, in the, the P equivales Q and make it Q equivales P. So there's the swap. So now what have we done in this step? We have manipulated the formula. We, ha we have exploited the properties of equivales, and so we manipulated the formula P equivales Q, and we made it Q equivales P. And now we're going to, to do the last step of the heuristic, reintroduce not equivales using its definition. So let's see what the next step is. It's the definition of not equivales 3.10 with PQ replaced by QP. All right, so let's take a look at 3.10 with PQ replaced by QP. So here is 3.10, and if you take PQ and replace it with QP, that 3.10 becomes Q not equals P equals not open paren Q equals P. So let's go back to our proof. And sure enough, we end up with Q not equals P. 
So that's an example of this heuristic, and we will use it, this, uh, this heuristic a lot in the theorems that we prove in the future. Okay, that's it for Lecture 9 Recap. See you next time.